Hello now retailers and welcome to the first in our new monthly series of 30 minute educational webinars from Now Foods. My name is Susan Velakis and I'm the training development coordinator for our online retailer training program, Now Productology, which I hope you're all familiar with. But if not, you can find information in the Now Retailer portal at www.nowfoods.com forward slash retailers. Today's webinar is Vitamin E Update to Cofferols and Tocotrienols. We hope that this presentation will help you better understand this important product category. Our presenter today is my colleague and friend, Jim Golick. Jim is a certified and licensed dietitian nutritionist in, in Illinois. He has a long history with Now Foods and he's currently part of our product information team at Now, where he answers questions and shares his vast knowledge with retailers, consumers, and practitioners from around the world. In his presentation, Jim will provide a quick te technical background of the vitamin E family of compounds, focusing on the similarities and differences between tocopherols and tocotrienols. And he'll also briefly discuss safe upper limits and introduce the new FDA regulatory revisions for labeling vitamin E products, something you'll definitely need to be aware of. So with that, I extend a warm Now Foods welcome to all of our retailers, and I thank you for being here. And it is now my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Jim Golick. Thank you, Sue. Welcome, everyone. So as Sue gave a wonderful introduction, we're going to be talking about tocotrienols and tocopherols and their similarities and differences, controversy, scientific studies, structure, function, et cetera. And the important thing about vitamin E is the most abundant lipophilic antioxidant found in cells. Lipophilic simply means fat loving. Since many cell, uh, all cell membranes basically have a, have a fatty cell structure, and the brain in particular is more than 60% or about 60% fat, this is important for many functions of, of the body, including the brain. Antioxidants protect cells from the damaging effects of free radicals especially reactive oxygen species, or ROS, which damage cells and contribute to the aging process. Vitamin E stops the production of ROS formed when fat oxidizes. An example of this is a vitamin E added to fish oil capsules to preserve the fats from oxidation. And if anyone was to ask you, as occasionally has been asked of me, how much vitamin E is in this fish oil, it's just an, uh, uh, an IU or two, nothing large, uh, because the vitamin E is there to protect that particular fish oil from going rancid, and it would get used up in part uh, during that process, so it's not really measured, but it's in small amounts. So vitamin E also absorbs ultraviolet light and helps protect the skin from UV light-induced free radicals and plays a role in the normal healing and immune functions in the skin as well. So by limiting free radical production, as well as through other mechanisms, vitamin E can help maintain healthy vascular structures and brain function. So the vitamin E family consists of the tocopherol family, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. Best food sources would be vegetable oils, raw nuts, seeds, soybeans, and whole grains. And the tocotrienol family, which also consists of similar uh, named alpha, beta, delta, and gamma tocotrienols. However, those best sources are palm and rice bran oils, or anatto, which are uncommon in the U.S. diet. Now, according to the FDA, for the last 50 years or better, only alpha tocopherol is considered to be vitamin E. So the other family members are not part of this international unit designation, which will be changing in a moment, which we'll be talking about. So here is a representation of how similar the tocopherol and the tocotrienol molecules appear. The only difference is these double bonds here in the tocotrienol chain that gives it more flexibility in being able to wrap around a fat membrane and be more protective, more of a shield, more of an armor, so to speak, around the fat portions of the cell, which is one of the reasons why tocotrienols can be of more importance sometimes when it comes to antioxidant uh, effects. Vitamin E content uh, found in various fats and oils in our diet varies considerably. 
Notice here palm kernel oil has very little. However, palm oil has a lot. And palm oil we'll be talking about later on when we go into our tocotrienol. So you can see here tocotrienol represented in red is found in great abundance in palm oil compared to the other food sources. We don't get a whole lot in olive oil, for instance, uh, but obviously we do in sunflower oil, which is one source of natural vitamin E, as well as soybean oil, and we'll be covering that in a moment as well. Now, here's an interesting thing. To obtain 400 international units of vitamin E, you would need to consume 10 cups of almonds or 13 tablespoons of wheat germ oil. Obviously, no one in their right mind would be eating 10 cups of almonds a day. I don't think we could handle that digestively or calorically. Uh, same with wheat germ oil. Now, here's the first introduction to a uh, subject because of uh, the FDA uh, labeling uh, changes uh, that are uh, happening uh, as we speak and for the next year and a half before they fully come into compliance. 400 international units, which is a unit of measurement, is now going to be designated as a milligram of weight, 268 milligrams. We're going to be covering that in a moment. Red palm tocotrienols, uh, while palm oil has the highest concentration, one would have to consume two cups of palm oil a day to have any benefits. You can see how much it would take in terms of, of actual crude uh, palm oil uh, uh, components to get down to a oil base and then get it in even more concentrated into its antioxidant components. So it takes from 60 pounds down to 41 grams in a typical bottle of red palm tocotrienol. So quite a lot of, uh, of concentration going on in that process. So coming back to the FDA 2016 revisions that we alluded to in a moment ago, the new daily value for vitamin E is also changing. Uh, it is now 15 milligrams of what's referred to as RRR, alpha tocopherol, and uh, that's lower than the previous uh, 20 milligrams. Uh, and RRR simply means natural D-alpha portion. Again, that one member of the eight-member vitamin E family only has that designation. So uh, simple math here to uh, introduce this subject, 100 international units, two-thirds of that, or about 67 milligrams, it would be the RRR, the D-alpha to call for a portion, uh, per the new labeling laws. So we're starting to see labels gradually change uh, for this year, and it'll be in full compliance by July of 2018. And again, 400 international units will be designated as 268 milligrams of RRR alpha tocopherol. And if you want to look more of that information, here is a link for that. Now, important thing to know, three national surveys done over a number of years have found that the American diet provides less than the RDA levels. So it is not in great abundance in our food supply unless we're eating uh, a lot of the food sources of it or get taking supplements. Speaking of food sources, here's an example here using, again, the old uh, 30 IU designation. Again, one milligram is the same as 1.5 IUs when we're talking about natural vitamin E. Now, something to be aware of, synthetic vitamin E uh, is a one-to-one -one ratio, one milligram, one IU, because synthetic vitamin E that is more likely to be found in drugstore brands, uh, mass market, supermarket kind of uh, brands quite often would uh, have perhaps a higher amount of weight listed for them, which might create some confusion with consumers that might come into a health food store and say, this vitamin E that I got at the drugstore says it has 400 milligrams of vitamin E. Yours only has 268 milligrams. What's going on? Well, the difference is that synthetic vitamin E is not as, as potent. The body doesn't recognize it as well. We'll cover that in a moment. So getting back to the food sources, wheat germ oil is a great source of that, as is raw sunflower seeds. You can see the difference here, raw sunflower seeds, uh, can get uh, uh, as much as 10 milligrams per serving compared to roasted, which would be seven. A uh, little bit less of a difference here on raw versus dry roasted almonds. And come down here to soybean oil, interestingly, soybean oil only has about one milligram per 
per serving, which is not the whole heck of a lot. And again, to reintroduce uh, or to introduce again the concept, the daily value now is 15 milligrams, uh, which would correlate to 22 international units instead of the original uh, ones that we've been using for years, 30 units. So uh, not only is the designation changing, but the quantity, uh, according to the FDA, that would equal the daily value has gone down. Now, how safe is vitamin E? Well, it turns out it's quite safe. Uh, the da daily tolerable upper limit, even for toddlers, is 200 milligrams or 300 IUs, all the way up to healthy adults, 1,000 milligrams or 1,500 international units. Uh, the tolerable upper limit is based on the potential for, for large amounts of vitamin E to have a blood thinning effect. Uh, again, it would be more likely more pronounced if a person was doing additional things, uh, such as maybe taking aspirin, maybe taking large quantities of fish oil, or especially if one is on an anti-clotting medication like a Coumadin, Warfarin, or some of the newer medications on the market, there certainly could be a potential for uh, one plus one equals three, an additive effect, and possibly more bleeding, so something to be aware of. Uh, and uh, point out to anybody if you're going to uh, be suggesting a vitamin E in the store, uh, might be helpful to to cover that with uh, with the individual with the question. Now, here's a question: How did vitamin E become so popular? If you've been around the nutrition field as long as I have, which is about 40 years, in my interest before I even uh, was into college, uh, vitamin E uh, became popular actually before I was born. Back in the 1940s and 50s, uh, there was a uh, brother uh, team, Dr. Wilfred and Evan Shute, up in London, Ontario, who used vitamin E with many thousands of patients using, at the time, d alpha tocopherol And based on this clinical experience, they published a medical textbook called alpha tocopherol and Cardiovascular Disease, followed up with the heart and vitamin E in 1956 for lay audiences, and also 1985 book, The Vitamin E Story, that covered that, again, for lay audience. Now, back in the 1950s and 60s, the American Medical Association refused to allow the presentation of their findings at medical conventions. They thought it was a whole bunch of, of uh, unproven hogwash, apparently. And in the early 1960s, the U.S. Post Office prevented the mailing of vitamin E supplements. So there's been a, quite an a interesting history with that. Now, if we fast forward about four decades to January of 2005, there was a meta-analysis done where 19 clinical trials were compiled together. And these were trials that either used vitamin E alone or vitamin E tested with other vitamins and minerals like a multiple vitamin. Now, a meta-analysis is supposed to be looking at similar groups of, of populations, even though it might be studies that were looking at other things. Uh, so these 19 clinical trials were cherry-picked, but it turns out there was quite a wide range of things that these other trials were looking at. So the data was, was, um, uh, came to the conclusion that vitamin E may increase mortality, and that created a lot of, of concern. Well, uh, this is January 2005. Well, uh, this meta-analysis uh, the, the, some of the questions and concerns and, and criticisms uh, that were brought up by other people is that these trials tested high dosages that involved adults with chronic diseases like diabetes or maybe a smoking history or that it had previous heart attacks. So these may not be generalizable to healthy adults. Some, some trials evaluate, evaluated multiple vitamin combinations, which is not really looking at vitamin E alone in certain amounts. And the findings also did not clearly establish at the lowest dosage of supplementation, what is associated with increased mortality risk. So a few months later, the same data was analyzed by an all-star team, and these are very good, well-known people like John Hathcock and Jeffrey Blumberg and Annette Dickinson and Margaret Traber, Lester Packer, uh, very uh, uh, well-respected scientists within the nutrition community, and they analyzing the data actually came up with a different conclusion. Vitamin E and C are safe across a broad range of intakes. So 
Uh, one has to be careful when they're reading the headlines or seeing what's appearing on the news. Uh, that's not ever the whole story uh, quite often in that regard. Uh, the conclusion uh, from one uh, uh, columnist was, keep taking your vitamin E. Those studies you've heard about are badly flawed. So, uh, getting back to the office to call for, as we mentioned before, the only form recognized to meet human requirements. Now, serum concentrations depend on the liver, which takes up the nutrient after absorption from the intestines. Now, here's a very important concept. The liver preferentially re-secretes only alpha-tocopherol via the alpha-tocopherol transfer protein, which we'll be using the term TTP throughout the rest of this presentation, which metabolizes and excretes the other vitamin E forms. So the blood and cellular concentrations of the other forms of vitamin E family are lower and have been the subject of less research. Because tocopherol transfer protein recycles alpha tocopherol back into circulation so efficiently, a deficiency state is not easy to induce experimentally. Yet the various forms of vitamin E have small structural differences but all act as free radical scavengers. So while there are huge differences in their biological activity, and TTP determines why those biologic differences occur, so while gamma tocopherol is the most prevalent form in the human diet, alpha tocopherol is the most biologically available form that we find circulating through the bloodstream and through the body. So it is the uh, tocopherol transfer protein is so efficient at, at, uh, at this process. The alpha tocopherol has a 100% transfer rate, while gamma tocopherol only has a 9% transfer rate, and delta tocopherol even less. So the plasma half-life half of alpha tocopherol, 48 hours, quite, quite uh, long lasting in the plasma. That's just a half-life. That doesn't mean it's out of the body in 48 hours. That means half of it's gone in 48 hours and then the other half would be a period of time after that. However, gamma tocopherol uh, is basically it has a half-life of 12 hours, whereas DL-alpha tocopherol, which is again synthetic, the, uh, D, uh, the uh, L after the D, of course, indicates that it's uh, a 50-50 molecule, uh, dextral and levo, left and right-handed molecules. Uh, again, D-alpha tocopherol, uh, the D-L-alpha tocopherol synthetic, usually a petroleum oil derived, but it also has a 12-hour half-life and is half as active. Now, research has shown that the tissues preferentially absorb D-alpha tocopherol better than the synthetic D-L-alpha form. So natural is better. I think we all know that inherently. Now, what are the deficiency symptoms of vitamin E? Well, they can be uh, loss of feeling or tingling sensation, could be uh, related to peripheral neuropathy, uh, ataxia, which would be a gait problem where a person may be losing their balance, skeletal myopathy, uh, myopathy meaning a weakness in the muscles, retinopathy that would affect the retina of the eye, and maybe an impaired immune response. Now, for all of these symptoms that I just mentioned, there could be other reasons for that. So doesn't necessarily mean that a person who has these other symptoms is related to a vitamin E deficiency or may or may not occur. Now, people with fat malabsorption disorders like Crohn's or cystic fibrosis or impaired bile secretion may become deficient. And the symptoms that a person might have could be chronic diarrhea or greasy stools. And even though it's not in my presentation, uh, celiac disease would also be potentially uh, an issue in that regard because it does impair a digestion of fat and fat soluble vitamins. Uh, how safe is vitamin E in pregnancy, lactation, and PMS? Well, quite safe. 400 units at weeks 18 to 22 of pregnancy, or 600 to 900 international units during the last two months of pregnancy, no adverse effects were reported. A combination of E and C in modest amounts, or I guess what we saw say health food amounts at 400 IUs and 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, helps to maintain normal blood pressure in high-risk women when started in week 16 to 22 of pregnancy. And uh, blood pressure in uh, pregnant women is quite a common concern and can be uh, certainly affect the health of mom and the fetus. So here's a simple solution potentially could be of help in that regard. 
uh, levitation, like we save in uh, RDA amounts. So vitamin E orally also seems to produce to reduce typical symptoms of PMS as well. So vitamin E supports cardiovascular health. How does it do that? Well, alpha tocopherol plays a critical role in cell proliferation and platelet function and monocyte activity. And monocyte is simply one of the white blood cells. Now, some of us are maybe familiar with the term of foam cells, F-O-A-M. Foam cells are oftentimes created in the bloodstream uh, in response to inflammatory conditions that can create part of that atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, so because uh, vitamin E is necessary for normal platelet adhesion and aggregation, there's always multiple mechanisms at work here, but platelets that stick together become sticky due to oxidation in particular, that becomes much more of an issue and uh, vitamin E can help uh, reduce that platelet adhesion issue in the aggregation or the clumping of the platelets. So uh, getting back to the tocopherol family as a whole, every antioxidant is effective only against particular kinds of free radicals. So gamma, beta, delta, tocopherol, each has a different antioxidant function that complements and enhances the activity of alpha tocopherol. So the bottom line here, take home message, mixed tocopherols are more effective than alpha tocopherol alone in quenching free radicals. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later on as well. So high doses of alpha tocopherol alone could reduce the blood levels of gamma tocopherol by 30 to 50%. So that's not uh, a good trade-off. This could explain why some studies have shown mixed results. So here again, gamma tocopherol is more effective in scavenging free radicals and nitrogen-oxygen species that cause inflammation and neurodegenerative disorders. Alpha tocopherol supplements significantly reduce serum gamma tocopherol, as I've just mentioned a moment ago, and this may have important biological effects. So therefore, any potential health benefits of alpha tocopherol supplements may be offset by deleterious changes in the bioavailability of other forms of tocopherols and tocotrienols. So the balance is an important factor, not just one single large amount of D-alpha. So this might account for the null effects, null meaning no effect one way or the other, of alpha tocopherol supplements in studies on vitamin E's effect on cognitive function. Now let's talk about vitamin E and prostate cancer risk. Research that has been done has been confusing and contradictory. Why? Well, some studies suggest that vitamin E consumption from diet or supplements is associated with a reduced risk of prostate cancer. However, other large-scale population studies suggest that increasing dietary or supplemental vitamin E is not associated with prostate cancer risk one way or the other. Now, in light, here's the important thing, the way we have to interpret some of these studies. In light of the different properties of tocopherols and tocotrienols, it becomes critical to specify which vitamin E forms are being studied in any future vitamin E publications. And future research will need to clarify differences. Was synthetic vitamin E used versus natural vitamin E? Was D-alpha alone used, or was there gamma in that study we used? Were tocotrienols used? If so, which ones? And were all eight vitamin E family member molecules involved in the study? That's almost never the case. So we have to be careful with some of the interpretation that some of the scientists looking at it, in my opinion, rather simplistically, have, have looked at. It's not just one molecule. We have to look at other family members. Now let's turn our attention to tocotrienols. So tocotrienols have been shown to possess superior free radical neutralizing and immunomodulating properties over alpha tocopherol. Tocotrienols clear rapidly from the plasma within less than 24 hours due to poor affinity of the tocopherol transfer protein. 
for tocotrienols. So as much as the tocotrienol transfer pro or the, the tocopherol, excuse me, the tocopherol transfer protein is important for uh, for uh, D alpha tocopherol uh, uptake and uh, reuse throughout the body, it does not carry over to tocotrienols. Uh, yet we're going to cover more about the importance of tocotrienols in a moment. The plasma concentrations of tocotrienols can be increased by at least twofold when consumed with meals, and this would be meals that would contain fat in particular that would uh, help that. Now, here's an important thing. Tocotrienols are 50 times more potent than tocopherols, and the brain is about 65% fat and prone to oxidative stress, so alpha tocopherol is a powerful protector of brain tissue even at nano molar concentrations. This is less than a part per billion. So it doesn't take a whole lot to have a very powerful antioxidant effect on the body. So such a tiny concentration represents the most important biological function of all the natural forms of the vitamin E family. Alpha tocotrienol has unique biological activity independent of its free radical scavenging capacity. So Alpha tocotrienol may help to promote normal arterial function, healthy cholesterol metabolism that the tocopherol family doesn't really have much of effect, at least not D-alpha tocopherol does not. Uh, gamma uh, tocopherol does, by the way, has some effect on cholesterol metabolism and brain and liver health. Alpha tocotrienol research demonstrates neuroprotective properties in brain tissue, which we talked about a moment ago. So I'll just, uh, finish up with the select vitamin E products of interest. One excellent product we have is Advanced Gamma E. This includes all eight of the vitamin E family compounds. Um, per two soft gel servings, the vitamin E would have the 400 IUs. Eventually that label will be listed as 268 milligrams, but currently it is uh, still at the old nomenclature of 400 IUs with 400 milligrams of the natural mixed tocopherols, including a good healthy amount of gamma tocopherol, 300 milligrams. So it's a nice, good balance of those, along with the 10 milligrams of the tocotrienol complex. Now, due to the fact that there is a, a limited uh, amount of time, the half-life I mentioned before on gamma uh, tocopherol and, and uh, Tocotrienol is about 12 hours. Ideally, one would take this two soft gel serving, one with breakfast and one with dinner, in order to have a, more of a 24 hour uh, production in, through the body. Uh, red palm tocotrienol is another excellent product that we have, is with the ethanol enhanced absorption, and it is non GMO and soy free from red palm oil. Now, interestingly, the vitamin E is only. Uh, 20 IUs from the D-alpha tocopherol uh, because tocotrienols are not a great source of D-alpha tocopherol. Uh, it does have 50 milligrams of the full spectrum tocotrienols, however. So I want you to be prepared for a possible argument if you had a customer looking at this label and can try and compare it to a 400 IU vitamin E. Uh, some customer might say, Wow, this doesn't have much vitamin E in it. It's pretty lousy. I don't want to spend all this extra money for this lousy vitamin E. No, you're missing the point. Because again, we have to keep in mind that tocotrienols may have up to 50 times greater antioxidant properties than the tocopherol, than D-alpha tocopherol. We have to look at that part of the puzzle as well. So it turns out that this does have quite a strong protection and support of cardiovascular and brain health. And if for those of you that are interested, approximately 45% of this would be gamma, 30% alpha, etc. And for the same reason I mentioned a moment ago with the advanced gamma E complex, ideally one would take perhaps two a day of these, maybe even three, that's what I take. But ideally one with breakfast and one with dinner. I personally take two with breakfast and one with dinner most days. Now, important thing again to look at is the uh, self-emulsifying delivery system that was created 
uh, to help uh, the absorption of red palm tocotrienols. An important way to look at that is compared to non uh, emulsified, uh, you can see quite a dramatic difference in that regard. An important thing here is that the 12 hour mark here, here, and here, there's a rather dramatic decline in the uh, plasma levels of the tocotrienols, which again is the argument for twice a day uh, amounts. A wonderful recommended reference. Uh, it, that I can not emphasize enough. I'd love for everybody to consider uh, going to Dr. Passwater's website uh, and reading. Uh, Richard Passwater is a research biochemist has been around since the 60s, studying antioxidants and nutrition. He's been the author of many books and articles on nutrition. He's been the science editor for Whole Foods Magazine for many years. Many of you might have seen some of his articles over the years. And some of his articles of vitamin E are available at his website. Uh, drpasswater.com and or wholefoodsmagazine.com. You can search for the vitamin connection because he covers a lot more details than I can cover in this brief uh, presentation. So uh, for people who may have questions regarding uh, this presentation or questions about any now products, you can simply visit productinfo at nowfoods.com or uh, dial in at 888-669-3663, extension 2594. We have a really excellent staff of nutritionists with collectively at least 100 years of experience between us, and we're very willing and to uh, answer your questions and provide additional information. We'd love to educate the retailers so that you can do a better job of educating your consumers. And that's the end well, of my presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jim. It was an excellent presentation. And uh, I do want to remind everyone that we host our webinars on the third Thursday of every month at 2 p.m. Central Time, and we also include a replay. Um, you can find information about the next webinar on the retailer portal page of the Now Foods website at nowfoods.com forward slash retailers. And if you're uh, listening to this now you'll see that the next one that we have scheduled for February is seasonal immune health from A to Zinc. So uh, just be sure to update yourself on the Now Foods website, nowfoods.com forward slash retailers to find out information for the next uh, webinar. So thank you everyone for joining us and thank you again, Jim, for the excellent information. You're welcome. Thank you all for tuning in.